In late 2017, world-renowned OK Video Game Destiny 2 was caught lying. As players completed particular missions over and over again, the UI would show that they got the same amount of experience each time, but in reality, it was being throttled behind the scenes to ensure they didn't progress too fast. This revelation sparked an uproar, prompting a swift fixing of the mechanic and attempts to calm the player base down. But why did this happen in the first place? What possible reason could there be to lie to players, the very people who've paid money to experience your video game? For a lot of people, the most important part of a game is fairness, and why wouldn't it be? Why play a game where the person you're playing against is cheating, right? A cheating player makes the whole experience just kind of pointless. But what if I told you that it isn't just players that cheat, games do it too. Games lie constantly to us in order to make the experience seem more enjoyable, to evoke a specific emotional response, or just to smooth over some of the glitches in human psychology without ever really telling you what they're doing. Surely that's exactly the same as a player cheating, right? It's a betrayal of trust, something that invalidates the experience both retroactively and going forwards. Simple ethics says the game should always be upfront with their players, or at least you'd think, wouldn't you? I'd actually argue the opposite. It's only because games manipulate us that we enjoy playing them at all. Now, the tactics used in Destiny 2 were pretty cynical, anti-fun, and were almost certainly financially motivated, but more often than not, these techniques aren't. That's why the unenviable task of trying to defend stuff just like this falls to me, because no one else is really dumb enough to try. Lying to players or even cheating behind the scenes is a perfectly valid technique so long as it gets used in the ultimate interest of the player and their experience. What's more, some of the best games ever wouldn't be anywhere near as enjoyable, or even possible, if the player weren't kept in the dark about certain aspects of their design. I'm going to be digging into a lot of games here, but the big spoiler warnings go out for Doom, XCOM 2, and Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. In a GDC talk earlier this year, Jennifer Shirley talks about how games are like magic tricks. Elaborate illusions designed to trick our perceptions and take advantage of your weird human brains. Our work uh, is to design for the human mind and the human perception. So the human mind is deeply flawed and designing for it means to design with the f these flaws in mind. The comparison seems strange at first. Magic tricks are all about sleight of hand, secret compartments and hidden things. It's not until we consider that the facet of video games we experience is a tiny fraction compared to what's happening underneath the surface that things begin to make sense. Let's start with the easy stuff, shall we? Platformers. Platformers are tight, focused tests of skill, but you'd be surprised about just how much stuff is done in the background to make them work. The average human's reaction speed for visual stimuli is around 250 milliseconds, plus input lag in the form of your computer rendering the graphics and then processing your input we can add on maybe an extra 100, plus another 50 for you actually pressing the button at all. This is some pretty loose on the fly maths, but we can confidently say that there can be as much of a third of a second gap between something appearing on your screen and your character reacting to it, and that's not even counting animation wind up. This is a big deal, because particularly in platformers a single missed input can make the difference between a hard won victory or a frustrating defeat. A third of a second doesn't seem like that long, but it's enough for Rayman to go from here to all the way over here. A recipe for potential disaster. And the last thing a developer wants is for a player to fail because they thought they jumped at the right time, but didn't account for their own reaction speed. That's why platformers have something called grace period jumping, or for people who aren't boring, coyote time, named after Wile E. Coyote from the Roadrunner cartoons. Coyote time lets characters still jump for a few frames after they've walked off the edge to compensate for our reactions and let us feel like the game is fair, even if it really isn't. You by all rights missed that jump and you should have fallen, but the game bailed you out. It's not just platformers either. A lot of games will liberally bend the rules in order to give you an advantage. In Bioshock, the first shot from an enemy's gun will always miss, so you aren't taken by surprise. Old school shmups have really tiny hitboxes relative to your sprite to compensate for you being bad at judging distances and a lot of third person games will sneakily steal control away from you to stop you getting stuck on terrain. Even if you don't realise it, the game is cheating for you in order to keep you playing the game how it was meant to be played. But all these changes are compensating for shortcomings in the way we process information, so it's not really cheating, right? Well, that's, that's basically fair enough. 
but it exposes the idea that what we think is fair and our own psyche are a little more flexible than we might like to consider. Games cheat not only to level the playing field between imperfect human brains and ultra-fast sexy computers, but also as a way of manipulating us into specific emotional states. Take 2016's Doom, which would love for you to think that every fight is a gory battle for survival, but it actually fiddles with health in order to change your perception. In Doom, your last few hit points are worth much more than the rest, meaning your health will rapidly deplete at the start of a fight, making you feel scared of the enemies you're facing but without actually killing you. The fact that you're on low health encourages you to use the brilliantly designed glory kill system to get some precious HP, giving you what feels like just enough to get your next glory kill health infusion. This creates a brilliant gameplay loop spurred on mostly by fear of death that is entirely in your head because the game is lying to you about how much danger you're actually in. If your HP total in Doom reflected how much damage you could really take, then you wouldn't feel the pressure to engage with the parts of Doom that make it awesome, namely the in-your-face crunchy combat and fantastic glory kills. Games don't just deceive you and cheat to keep the tension high though, they can actually work more directly in your favour. For example, in Spelunky, if you're rushing to the bottom either as part of a speedrun or just because you're in a hurry, then you might not notice any of the dreaded dark levels spawning. That's because if you finish a stage in under 20 seconds, the next one can't be a dark stage, so as to let speedrunners keep playing the game in the way that's fun for them, even if it's technically breaking the rules. AI, tweaks and cheats in particular, are used to great effect in order to evoke some specific feelings in the player. For example, in the Batman Arkham games, the various flavours of goon you fight will never pull 180 degree turns, so they don't turn around and stop you feeling like the world's greatest detective slash advertisement for medical insurance. The reverse of this would be the titular alien in Alien Isolation, which actually has two separate AIs which work together to hunt you down, one more traditional one that reacts to noise you make and investigates signs of your presence, and another omniscient one that gives the first clues, ensuring that it always knows your approximate location, giving the eerie impression that it's hunting or toying with you, even though the reality is that the game is just twisting what you thought were the rules to keep the fear levels up. But the best example of a game that manipulates you into thinking and feeling a certain way is actually one that's heralded as harsh but fair and a testament to the cruelty of random chance. A game until recently I didn't know lies and cheats as much as a conservative politician come election time. I'm talking of course about XCOM 2. Let's start off with enemies. On every difficulty except legendary, enemy packs a path away from you or will even run out of combat range to ensure you're usually fighting no more than 6 aliens or 12 last at a time. On top of that, each non-legend difficulty mission has a chance to generate a substantially easier variant to ease off the pressure after a few deaths. On Rookie and Veteran, you have a global 1.2 and 1.1 multiplier respectively on all of your hit chances, meaning that a displayed 50% hit chance on Veteran is actually 55 and on Rookie is actually 60. I've done some testing and hit chances seem to be a little higher on average on Commander than on Legend, but we'll chalk that one up to variance. The secret maths doesn't stop there. On every difficulty except Legend, when you miss a shot of 50% or above, the game gives you a stacking aim buff. On difficulties below Commander, you also get a stacking buff to defence when enemies hit you and aim for each soldier below 4 you have, meaning that on Rookie, if you've only got one guy left, he gets a massive plus 45% to his aim. The really sneaky part though is that all these bonuses cap out at 95%, meaning you'll never be quite sure if the game is helping you or not, and you'll still have a fair few memorable moments where you get angry at the bullshit cheating video game, come on! Distracting you from how heavily the game is actually cheating in your favour. The only difficulty mode that doesn't cheat for you is the highest one, Legend, and I bet some of you are thinking that they're just going to play that from now on. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that a lot of the time, fairness? It just isn't very fun. Here's two YouTubers and veteran XCOM fans, Ben and Lewis of the Oxcast, playing XCOM 2 and what they think about Legend difficulty. I know that Legend is... Legend's bullshit though, It's right? kind of... Well, it's just longer. That's the thing. And uh, it's kind of... It kind of bullshits you on the RNG. And we're not playing on Safe Scum, we're playing... These guys who don't know anything about the behind-the-scenes cheating actually think the only fair difficulty mode isn't fun, that it quote, bullshits you. It sounds illogical, and it is, because humans aren't logical. Humans love to pretend that they're rational creatures guided by facts, but the truth is that you're ruled by subjectivity. 
XCOM is designed to be punitively hard in places to give you memorable defeats and losses, but is overall weighted in your favour to give you the experience of triumphing over what you think are insurmountable odds. But why do this at all? XCOM is supposed to be a game about tense tactical battles. Isn't that ruined if the game is helping you? Well, the lead designer of XCOM 2, Jake Solomon, says that the game is at its best when the player is taking risks, and he's right. Risks are fun, and having our tactical know-how pay off in combination with a bit of gambling feels awesome. The issue is that when confronted with real statistics, we interpret them incorrectly. We think that two 50% chances equals one guaranteed hit, and that 85% chances can't miss. In the words of Jake Solomon, we think about statistics emotionally, not mathematically, and it's why legend difficulty feels bullshit. So instead of being accurate and making you feel bad, XCOM rewards your legitimate tactical insight in the way you might expect by feeding you incorrect information it knows you'll think emotionally about, and then being balanced around the real, secret numbers, tricking you into having the experience you wanted all along. The barriers and challenges games put up aren't the same as the ones another human might. They exist purely for your gratification. The ideal experience of XCOM, just like in almost any other game, isn't a fair one, because if they were fair, you either wouldn't make progress, would be forced to play in a very boring way, or just plain wouldn't have fun. To illustrate my point, take Mirror's Edge, a parkour game which not so secretly uses the colour red to tell you where to go. By subconsciously being directed, oh that's awful, you get to feel like the acrobatic expert the game wants you to feel like, and it's a load of fun. Now turn the red helper colour off. The game suddenly becomes confusing, frustrating, and much slower paced robbing you of that cool experience. As tough as it is to come to terms with, games cheating, particularly in your favour, often makes them better. Let's take a look at a game that makes its name on deceiving you. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. Now a secondary spoiler warning here because this is a big one, but it's super interesting so go and play Hellblade and then come back, okay? <sighs> oh, thank god those guys are gone, right? I mean, oh, seriously, what a bunch of dicks. Oh, oh, welcome back. Oh, did you enjoy it? Oh, no, me neither, but it's great, isn't it? Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is a game that deals deeply with psychosis, a condition which causes those who suffer from it to have difficulty grasping a consistent reality. To portray this, the game bombards you with disembodied voices, offering helpful tips, warnings to stay away, and outright lies seemingly at random. The plot is deliberately achronological and convoluted, blurring the line between reality and metaphor constantly. It's great, but that is all overshadowed by this big moment here. A big moment that I may have tastelessly spoiled in a much earlier video, yeah real, real sorry about that one by the way. The game tells you that you have limited lives. Each time you die, this infection will creep up Senua's arm until it reaches her head, and then boom. Save data, wiped. This is a huge threat, and not one many people will take lightly, a threat that caused no small degree of controversy when it was first revealed. This information totally changes the game. Each mind-bending death inches you closer to having to do it all over again, and the paranoia of not knowing how many deaths you are away from deletion, or how close Senua herself is to death until it's too late, is deliciously agonising. But it's not real. There is no penalty on the number of times you can die, and the game never tells you. How brilliant is that? All that paranoia, your frustration and terror directed at the game, it was all in your head. Excellently simulating psychosis, as well as revealing a more fundamental truth about game design. Games are just an assortment of pixels, sounds and numbers designed to get you to feel something, and that means that no trick or deception is beyond consideration so long as it improves that experience. I think it's important to distance ourselves from this arbitrary and kind of unhelpful idea that games shouldn't try to trick or lie to us because when you get right down to it, no game is really fair. Sure, some games are totally upfront about their mechanics, and I mean, Hellblade is more honest than most, but they're still specifically designed to be interacted with, and more often than not, beaten. Coded so that certain things happen at specific times, so as to convey ideas to you the player. The deeper you look into any game, the more this illusion falls away. Dark Souls bosses deliberately leave openings for you to get a cheeky hit in, racing games use rubber banding to ensure you're always engaging with the most interesting mechanics and every race feels close, these timed collapsing building bits in Uncharted are sped up or slowed down depending on how well you're doing so you always reach the end just in the nick of time, 
and even Pac-Man can take corners more quickly than the ghosts, so you can always get away. This is the magic trick that Jennifer Shirley was on about. Not to hide a single game mechanic in order to pull a cheap trick at the player's expense, but to convince them, even a little, that the game they're playing is real, cohesive and fair, so as to communicate something so much greater. That's why it sucks so much that the highly publicised examples of games lying to players are the ones that give this powerful tool in the development arsenal such a bad name. For every game as scummy, boring, badly written, shallow, wait where was I going with this? Oh right, for every game as scummy as Destiny 2, there are a hundred great games that lie to you in order to give you an experience that you didn't even know you wanted. Knowing games use sneaky tactics to get us to experience them in different ways, won't ruin the experience in the same way that knowing how special effects work doesn't take away the magic of movies, and can even make watching them more interesting. The thing to remember is that it's basically okay to feel a bit betrayed when you find out you were tricked, but we also need to understand that when games do lie and cheat and mislead, they're not doing it for themselves or even for the developer. They're doing it for us. Hi and thanks for watching. If you'd like to ruin more games for yourself, I'd highly recommend going and checking out Jennifer Shelley's whole talk. I based a lot of the points in this video around her writing, so do go and give her the attention she deserves. Now, if you'd like to give me the attention I clearly don't deserve, then you should try the whole algorithm appeasement thing, you know, like, comment, subscribe, share the video, sacrifice a goat, that sort of thing. Alternatively, you could support me on Patreon, like these cool people, my top tier supporters. They are Samuel Vanderplatz, Alex Deloch, Dirk Jan Karenbeld, Ray's Dad, Joseph Robson, Joshua Binswanger, Lunar Eagle 1996, Daniel Metjes, Strateger in Ultima, Patrick Romberg, Baxter Heel, Fido, Brian Notariani, Asaran, Jonathan Kirkinson, Alexis Chenyaz, and Chow. Well, on that note, thank you for watching. Stay tuned for another video, and uh, I will see you in the next one. Bye!